Good evening, everyone. My name is Danny Wasserman, and I am the executive director of the Lumen Christi Institute. I want to welcome you here to the lovely common room at Swift Hall at U of C. It's lovely to have you all here to join us for tonight's lecture. But first, I'll say a bit about the, the history and mission of Lumen Christi, and then uh, I will introduce our distinguished speaker. The Lumen Christi Institute was founded in 1997, just over 25 years ago, by Catholic scholars here at the University of Chicago. And our mission is to make the Catholic intellectual tradition a vital part of the secular university and of the broader culture. Uh, to put it another way, we're interested in dialogue. Uh, we think that the secular university has something to offer to Catholics, and we also believe that the Catholic intellectual tradition has something to offer to the secular culture. I'd like to tell you about a couple of other events that we have coming up soon. Next week, here at Swift Hall, in a different room, we will host the distinguished theologian Dennis Turner, emeritus professor from Yale, who will speak on the topic Dante and a Poet's Journey in Hope. That's Thursday the 26th at 5 p.m. here in Swift. And then a little bit later, Wednesday, November 1st, this is just west of downtown, we will host a lecture entitled The Making of St. Ignatius. And that's Wednesday, November 1st, All Saints Day. Uh, at 5 p.m. at St. Ignatius College Prep, if you'd like to make a little trip. Today's event is entitled Romano Guardini on Technology and the Liturgy. Uh, though uh, Guardini has a wonderfully Italian name, uh, some of you, maybe all of you, know that he spent most of his life in Germany, uh, though, though born in Italy. And he wrote a long list of books. They, he was both a Catholic priest and a philosopher, and you can see this from the titles of his books, which translated into English, here are a couple of examples. One is entitled The Lord, straightforward, maybe straightforward, maybe not, uh, and The Art of Praying, that's on one, den, one end. And then he also has The End of the Modern World and The Death of Socrates. He was a professor of philosophy in Germany, and one person described him as a professor of Katholische Weltanschauung, so a professor of Catholic worldview, uh, a lovely title. Uh, we at the Lumen Christi Institute strive in our programs to transcend the ideological divide, both within the church and in the broader society. And for this reason, Guardini, I, I'm starting to think of him as sort of a patron saint, uh, though he's not technically a saint yet, uh, in, in Guardini. So he's been called the beloved theologian of both Pope Benedict and of Pope Francis. And if you know a little bit about church politics, you know that those two are not always seen as being on exactly the same side of things, but both were inspired by Romano Guardini. Today, I'd like to express gratitude to our sponsors. Uh, first, to our generous benefactors who make it possible to have programs like this for free here at the University of Chicago campus. And this specific event is co-sponsored not only by the UChicago Divinity School, but also by the John Templeton Foundation, specifically through the grant In Lumine, supporting the Catholic intellectual tradition on campuses nationwide. You can, if you like our work, you can support our work in many ways. You can tell other people about these events, invite them to, to upcoming ones. Uh, word of mouth is the best way to invite others into this conversation. And you can also sign up for our mailing list, follow us on social media. Lastly, before I introduce uh, Peter, uh, Dr. Casarella, I'll just say that there will be an opportunity for Q&A afterward, and we'll have time for questions from the audience here in the room and also from the audience online. We'll do our best. We Limitations of time, we might not be able to get to everyone, but we will, we will try. And finally, the program tonight is being recorded, and we'll stream it from our YouTube page, post it to our website in the near future. And now I have the, the pleasure of introducing Professor Peter Casarella. Professor Casarella is at the appointed on the faculty of the Duke Divinity School as of 2020. And he is no stranger to Chicago. He taught at Notre Dame from 2013 to 2020, and before that at DePaul University from 2006 to 2013. And I found out today that he lived in Hyde Park uh, for many years when he was a resident of Chicagoland. <clears throat> It's almost enough to forgive him for getting all three of his degrees from Yale. So he likes Hyde Park. So we'll, I'll take that as a win. Uh, Professor Casarella is an expert in a 
a wide range of topics within the study of theology. He has two books in medieval theology. One is entitled Word as Bread, Language and Theology in Nicholas of Cusa. He also has written on the Hispanic presence in the U.S. Catholic Church. One of his books is entitled Cuerpo de Cristo, Body of Christ. And he also has written on the topic of contemporary ecumenism. The title of the book, The Whole is Greater Than Its Parts, and there are many others. He's written over 90 articles, Neoplatonism, Theological Aesthetics, Intercultural Thought. It's kind of embarrassing uh, to read about the, the wide range of his expertise. And I wanted to just highlight the wide range of topics that he's written on, particularly because I think you might notice as he speaks that he is a noticeably humble man. Uh, and for that reason, um, and for, for many other reasons, he's also starting an initiative at Duke University that's a sister program to Lumen Christi called Fons Vitae, an initiative at Duke University to foster discussions about the Catholic intellectual tradition. So for many reasons, it's a great honor to have Professor Peter Casarella here with us. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Danny, for that overly generous introduction. Um, I accept the offer of forgiveness for not having a degree from the University of Chicago. Um, and uh, I do everything I can to collect some of the spirit from Lumen Christi and take it back with me to do. So my topic for this evening is Romano Gardini on technology and liturgy. Um, just to give you a quick overview of what I intend to present, I'd like to begin with a thesis about the idea of reform in Romano Gardini. And actually, my thesis is that it's not an idea, a fully formed idea at all. And then I'll talk for a little while about the religious epistemology and kind of the symbiosis of Thomism and phenomenology that Gardini developed in these early years. Because the two major writings that I want to focus on, one is the letters from Lake Cuomo, Another is an essay on liturgical formation. Both come out of this early Gardini, uh, both written around 1923-1925 in the Weimar period. And then I'll say a word about the, the question concerning technology and look into two other thinkers, um, namely uh, Michel Foucault and uh, Giorgio Agamben on the question of technology and how Gardini compares and contrasts with them. And then I'll offer a synthesis showing how there's an underlying uh, vision that connects Gardini on technology with Gardini on liturgy. Romano Gardini was certainly an early advocate in the 20th century for ref the reform of the Catholic Church. And what I'm about to uh, develop as an idea actually fits in very well with what Danny was talking about regarding the seemingly unlikely fact that both Pope Benedict and Pope Francis uh, were, were really students of Romano Gardini. The approach to reform in Romano, Romano Gardini, however, is less that of a fully formed idea or a fixed ecclesial strategy than an ongoing glance, you would have used the word blick, or better yet, a vision. In some very real sense, Gardini's vision of reform is the reform of vision itself. Since that's my thesis statement, let me just kind of repeat that. Gardini's vision of reform is the reform of vision itself. This programmatic statement will hardly end debates about Gardini's importance or proper place in 20th century Catholic theology. Catholic scholars have been feuding for decades about how to classify Gardini, especially with respect to the reforms of the Second Vatican Council. For example, Hans Urs von Balthasar wrote a beautiful and fitting tribute to Gardini. In English, it's called uh, Romano Gardini Reform from the Source. But the original title, which I'm going to reflect upon here, is uh, Reform aus dem Ursprung, Reform Rooted in the Ursprung, or Origin. This clever title of von Balthasar does little to satisfy the craving of an English-speaking reader who might want to know where von Balthasar stood regarding Gardini's placement as either an advocate or an opponent of liturgical reform. There is a conscious ambiguity in von Balthasar's original title, Reform aus dem Ursprung, 
can refer to the process of ressourcement, recovery, that took place prior and during the Second Vatican Council, whereby the liturgical texts and practices from the early witness of the church became a basis for a new mystagogy and a new rite of initiation, to name just one example. But reform aus dem Ursprung is a more basic and a different battle cry than return to the sources, since the word Ursprung is used by von Balthasar in his title only in the singular and not in the plural. Ursprung would not be used in the plural here, and Quellen, or sources, would have a very different connotation. In tension, then, to the Ressourcement reading of this title, philosophers like Martin Heidegger had used the word Ursprung, I'm thinking of his 1936 work, vom Ursprung des Kunstwerkes, from the origin of the work of art, to speak about a fundamental approach to understanding the truth of a thing or an event, its original manifestation in the order of being. Origin, for the early Heidegger, is the very compass of human existence. And Gardini and Heidegger actually met in Freiburg. This, to use a Heideggerian term, a le theological sense of the word Ursprung is not reducible to one in a series of identifiable sources. It refers to a mysterious origin, an origin beyond origins that is slightly beyond our immediate grasp, but even more necessary to keep in view than the multiple sources that could lead to a possible renewal. This deeper and more singular origin cannot be dismissed. We must struggle to regain it if we care about our well-being. Gardini himself was aware of this ambiguity about the sources of liturgical renewal. In a letter to the director of the Liturgical Institute in Trier about the current state of the liturgy, written while the council was unfolding and soon after the promulgation of the dogmatic constitution and liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium, Gardini states that he prefers not to speak about erneuerung, renewal, but about the diverse ways in which the human person today can stand in the truth of the celebration of the holy mysteries. So, von Balthasar's title, Reform aus dem Ursprung, thus signifies that liturgical reform cannot move forward simply as a way to replace the previous epical shifts, patristic, medieval, modern, with a new postmodern framework. Gardini argues and Danny just alluded to this, argues for most of his life in favor of a new Christian worldview on the paradoxical assumption that the very framework we use to make judgments about past frameworks needs to be subjected to very careful scrutiny before we can mechanically impose it as a new technique that corrects the outdated one. Liturgical reform, in other words, can become its own technocracy, which is not a claim to abdicate the reform process altogether. This philological detour about the Ursprung of reform brings me back to the central question of vision. From Balthasar himself stated in the same book the following, Gardini's most essential task was to see the world. This was also his most original inheritance. Seeing, for Gardini, is anything but passive. Seeing, rather, betokens a determined effort to offer space, to make oneself available for that which can be perceived as truth, va genomen. So, von Balthasar trades in another word play. The German word va nemung contains within it the word for truth, va, wahrheit. Perception, that's the normal translation of va nemung, perception is etymologically not just an impressing of a mark on the tabula rasa of the mind, it is a taking in of what is discovered as true. So Gardini's, and he says this explicitly, our Gardini's path to affirm the Thomistic dictum that nothing can come into the intellect until, unless it first passes through the senses must therefore go through this rigorous phenomenological test of seeking and encountering the self-disclosure of truth. What about technology? How does it relate to liturgy in the world of everyday life? Technology for Gardini is not about acquiring gadgets or accelerating our access to conveniences. In fact, the very question concerning technology in Gardini is never ultimately about more or less. Nor is Gardini saying in a doomsday fashion that we have been enveloped in our overwhelmingly technological age by an invisible power that we are simply unable to resist. Technology for Gardini is ultimately about the use of power by a human agent endowed by God with freedom. The problem of technology 
properly comes into view, when the world around the human person is filtered through and constrained by what he calls a technocratic paradigm. For this reason, technology is also, at its root, a problem of vision. Other philosophers of the 20th century also acknowledge the end of the modern world shared this starting point. Martin Heidegger had associated technology with das Gestell, a difficult concept to grasp, even though it's usually translated somewhat awkwardly as in framing. And Michel Foucault and Giorgio Agamben follow in Heidegger's footsteps when they speak about the framing of le dispositif, or in Agamben it's il apparato, usually translated as something like the apparatus or a device. We return to these odd vocabularies at the end of the lecture because they are useful reference points for understanding the true scope of the new awareness that Gardini set out to realize at the end of the modern age in his writings about liturgy and in his writings about technology. These philosophers are seeking to grasp the big picture into which technology fits, including in terms of a new political order. To see this picture, which we have already identified as a consciously paradoxical task, requires a new discipline or formation that yields a new way to look at things, a way to see things as if we were seeing them for the very first time. The exploration of Gardini's religious apology, excuse me, religious epistemology that now follows is an attempt, a first attempt, to lay out the basic elements of the vision that, Gardi that led Gardini to propose this kind of reform of vision itself. Seeing, knowing, and believing, according to Romano Gardini. Seeing is already, this is the Caravaggio painting of the road to Emmaus, which I'll come to in just one second. And of course, Caravaggio is the master of the chiaroscuro, and you see here a kind of vision about vision itself. Um, yeah. Seeing is already a religious problem in the New Testament. Compare, for example, Jesus' words to the doubting Thomas in John 20, 29. Have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Compare those words with the testimony regarding the epiphany at the end of the road to Mose of Emmaus in Luke 24, here depicted by Caravaggio. And that reads as follows. And it happened that while he was with them at the table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. But he vanished from their sight. Both meditations deal with the so-called eyes of faith, but not in the same way. The doubting Thomas is told that the true faith will be held by those who come after the first disciples because they will, quote-unquote, see the identity of Jesus Christ without the aid of a direct eyewitness. This is, to use a term that Gardini might have employed, the Kierkegaardian vision of faith, more of a leap than a steady observation. The ending in the parable in Luke offers almost the exact opposite lesson. For their faithful accompaniment, and by sharing a meal with the one whom they profess as Lord, the earliest disciples are given a glance of the identity of the Savior only in the breaking of the bread. His vanishing from sight upon that recognition implies that they are now equipped because of that vision. They are now ready to hand on to the Christian community the good news regarding the one who has been truly brought back from among the dead. So the question then becomes the following. Are we supposed to see because we believe in the Lord and are ready to take a leap, John, or believe and evangelize because we have been granted a vision of the Lord after a steady process of readiness, observation, and accompaniment. Luke, the lives of saints could send us in both directions at once. Now, vision plays a central role in Gardini's salvation history and thereby opens up a much broader compass than just an isolated viewer standing alone in the cosmos. The eyes of faith are at the center of the human grasp of revelation, the role of the revealed word in the shaping of human history, and even in our encounter with other persons. And here I'm summarizing a great bit deal of research uh, about Gardini's early philosophical formation. He'd written on St. Bonaventure, the idea of salvation in St. Bonaventure, and he had a great deal of access to early 20th century philosophical sources, including Husserl and Heidegger, but he took his distance from them. He had encounters with Max Scheler and others, and also was very indebted to Martin Buber on certain questions. But 
To summarize this, the influence of Gardini's early philosophical personalism can be seen in his theology of revelation. At one point in his book, Welt und Person, World and Person, he writes, and this kind of summarizes the point I want to make here, in the reconstituted gaze, the visage is opened and a relationship is born in which eyes are seen within eyes. In the reconstituted gaze, the visage is open and a relationship is born in which eyes are seen within eyes. End of quote. In other words, face-to-face -face encounters are revealing. Gardini was a student of both the newly discovered Augustinian personalism as well as the personalism came to Edestein through Edmund Husserl and Martin Heidegger. From those two vantage points and in di dialogue with Jewish personalists like Martin Buber, he developed a new philosophical synthesis of the relationship of I, thou, and world. Now, another point, which is well-developed in early Gardini, concerns seeing the world with the eyes of Christ. Seeing the worlds with the eyes of Christ can guide us into the world. And in fact, and this gets to the point just made about Francis and Benedict, Pope Francis picked up on this insight in the encyclical that was written with four hands. You know, at the beginning of the pontificate, Pope Francis, he almost immediately uh, published uh, Lumen Fidei, um, and he very humbly acknowledged that most of it had been written by Pope Benedict. He just put the finishing touches on it. Uh, and this is a quote from uh, Lumen Fidei, number 22, but it gets to this point about the common heritage of the two uh, thinkers, Francis and Benedict in Gardini. The quote is as follows. Christians are one, quote unquote, see Galatians 3.28, yet in a way which does not make them lose their individuality. In service to others, they come into their own in the highest degree. This explains why, apart from this body, outside this unity of the church in Christ, outside this church, which, in the words of Romano Gardini, is the bearer within history of the plenary gaze of Christ on the world, faith loses its measure. Measure is put here in quotes. It no longer finds its equilibrium, the space needed to sustain itself. Faith is necessarily ecclesial. It is professed from within the body of Christ as a concrete communion of believers, end of quote from Lumen Fidei 22, and that comes from Gardini's uh, On the Essence of the Catholic Worldview. So the newly elected Pope highlights that the measure, quote unquote, of Christ, which is itself a paradoxical term, since there are no measurements that encompasses Christ's dominion on hell, heaven and earth, that the measure of Christ is a gift of faith that can help us to find an equilibrium in the world. The body of Christ which is the church, offers us this gaze, not as a message, not as an information packet or a download, but as an encounter to be shared with others. So the experience of the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4 could be a model for this encounter. The insights of Gardini, however, go beyond the interpersonal without allowing the dialogue of I and thou to be lost in a cosmic synthesis. Dialogue remains the mode of access to reality, even as the scope of what the eye sees is broadened to look at the whole. Let me uh, illustrate with a reference to the fifth epistle <clears throat> in the letters on Lake Como from the early 20s. The fifth letter deals with Ubersicht and is usually entitled Surveying, although as we talked about this morning in Lumen Christi, um, that's not the best translation. The Italian is lo sguardo di insieme, a glance at the whole. So this holistic vision is what is at stake in the fifth uh, of the letters. This form of vision is an active, engaged one, one that allows us to open up this new space in which, with the, from Baltasar talked about, in which we can dwell in the truth and see reality anew. Now, as Gardini says very clearly in that letter, uh, the First World War left many dead. In fact, 20 million dead and 21 million injured. That unprecedented brutality shook up Gardini and the rest of Europe and demanded, in Gardini's view, a new view of the world itself. In the fifth letter, he contrasts the ancient oikumene, the breadth of the known world, with the post-World War I, 
picture or need to picture a surveyable world, looking at the earth from above as a finite world. Gardini continues by stating that the period of discovery seems to be passing and that the digging into unexplored fields ceasing, now it seems is a time to take stock. And this goes back to the thesis that he later developed in his uh, book, The End of the Modern World, that Enlightenment progress had ended with World War I, that the new discoveries could happen afterwards, even after the discovery of quantum physics, there can be new discoveries about reality. But the idea that there was a frontier at the edge of the earth that was going to be expanded through uh, the agency of human rationality was over. And therefore, Gardini configures himself as a, not a modern thinker, but as a postmodern thinker. And thereby, and now going back to the letters, he envisions the birth of a new form of thinking. Quoting from page 41 of the letters, the mechanical components are not forced out, but we are given the task of seeing and considering how the mechanical and the non-mechanical orders work in and with one another. Finally, at the end of the fifth letter, he asks his reader to think not about the extensiveness of the new global reality, even mentioning the need to go beyond European perspectives and looking at Asia and, and, and other places outside of Europe. Not about the extensiveness of the new global reality, but a deeper form of analysis that he calls intensive thinking. So mechanical worldview is extensive, and the new form, the, at the end of the binary, the new form thinking is going to be intensive. What is intensive thinking? He says, page 42, it is moving from the multiple to the nexus from extension and survey to depth. Now, it's interesting to note some influences beyond what I've already talked about, the Augustinian personalism, on Gardini's holistic concept of Ubersicht in the letters. He's writing in the age of the birth of quantum mechanics, in which the certainties of the Newtonian grid for understanding reality in mechanical terms is giving way to a new order of thinking, more in line with the hypothesis of uncertainty put forward by Werner Heisenberg. You see that in particular in his early book, Der Gegensatz, Oppositions. And I, but I want to highlight two sources here with the understanding of much more research is needed precisely on this point. First, the lectures of Edmund Husserl from 1907, what Husserl later referred to as his thing lectures, uh, deal with thing and space. Husserl was trying gradually to move beyond the transcendental subjectivity in Kant's modeling of philosophy on Newtonian mechanics. In chapter 13 of the 1907 lectures, Husserl considers the constitution of space through the conversion of the oculomotor field into an expansional and turning manifold. Even more interesting than this new development, this post-Newtonian, post-Kantian development within Husserl's evolving phenomenology, even more interesting are the notes that Husserl's student Edith Stein provided in 1917 as an addendum to these lectures. She looks intensively at the movement of the body. I am moved, she said, is an eye and not just a mechanical object. So she's already beginning to think about a somatic phenomenology in her notes on Husserl's 1907 lectures. She's looking at Husserl in a more holistic fashion, arguably, than Husserl was able to look at in his own writings. So that's one point. Another point, which is developed by the sociologist Kieran Flanagan, concerns uh, the early work of Georg Simmel, 1903 work, The Metropolitan, the Metropolitan and Mental Life. I'm unsure about the exact connection between Gardini and Simmel, but uh, those of you more familiar with Simmel than I am will know that the, the insight that Simmel had uh, regarding the development of a new uh, field of social science came from his idea that when you go through a city and look at the metropolitan, that you see things, life forms, bodies, and souls that can't be grasped in any other way than through the eye. So Flanagan argues that in his book, uh, Seen and Unseen, that there's a new insight about the ocular metaphor in Simmel that has to do with the uh, urban sociology that Simmel was developing in 1903. And that seems very relevant in terms of what Gardini is doing. Anyway, those are just two little teasers there about some unexplored paths regarding our Gardini's early phenomenology. The eyes figure prominently in the text published, first published in 1950, Die Sinne und die religiöse Erkenntnis, Sense Perception and Religious Understanding. 
The first of those three essays deals with the priority of the I in the study of religion and takes its point of departure from St. Paul. St. Paul writes in his letter to the Romans, For what can be known about God is evident to them, because God made it evident to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes of eternal power and divinity have been able to be understood and perceived in what he has made. As a result, they have no excuse. For although they knew God, they did not accord him glory as God or give him thanks. Instead, they became vain in their reasoning, and their senseless minds were darkened. This is a very traditional text that Thomas Aquinas and John Calvin and practically everyone in the Christian tradition had commented on. But Gardini starts by saying, I'm not going to give you a theological commentary on Romans 1, 19 through 20. It's kind of the standard text in natural theology and many other kind of ventures in which theologians had endeavored over the years. Gardini undertakes a deliberately philosophical, even phenomenological analysis of this passage. He is interested almost exclusively in the, ph the phenomenology of what Husserl called the oculomotor field, more so than in the religious meaning of the text, although he has a very interesting reflection on Jakob Burkhardt's uh, idea about the uh, Einstein, the very establishment of religion as something that is sociogenetic, and says that this is what modernity has given us, the idea that religion had to be established through some social or psychological force. And what is valuable about Paul is turning that on its head and beginning to look at what God has given us in, in creation itself. But Gardini is ultimately trying to find some intersection between phenomenology and theology. He prioritizes sight over the other four senses, and one could question him, question him on that point. He admits in a footnote that one could undertake a study of hearing, tasting, seeing, and smelling, but maintains in an Augustinian fashion that sight has priority. In this respect, I see Gardini as a phenomenological adherent to the doctrine of visio intellectualis, intellectual vision, that he would have discovered in Augustine's De Trinitate and in Augustine's Confessions. In Augustine, the eye sees in a platonic fashion the totality of the human person, the human person as not just body and not just soul, but as body and soul. In Gardini, there is an encounter between the human eye and the reality of life that presents itself to the eye as a new formulation of this Augustinian uh, overcoming of dualism, overcoming of Manichaeanism. For Gardini, and this is explicitly what he says in Das Auge und die religiöse Erkenntnis, for Gardini, the eye is more than a camera. It is this more that is decisive for his whole project. He maintains, as did Simmel before him, that the eye can see the soul of a person when that person crosses the street or enters a room. What is meant by this? Gardini says that the eye is not just an instrument that the living person uses. The eye is life itself. All the problems that are encountered through the senses are turned back into the eye. The struggles for justice and the struggle with evil that the person undergoes comes into play in the eye. So as a contemporary example, think of the visionary dimensions of Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. King is not laying out, when he was standing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, King is not laying out a physical description in the United States, but is still standing on the Lincoln Memorial with a truth that he can see and that others have not yet envisioned. In Gardini's terms, I'll read this first in German, but then immediately translate it because it's hard to translate. Der Bedeutungsbezug dieser Wesens erfassen hat sich geschlossen. Ich habe Wahrheit erkannt. So in Gardini's terms, the connection to meaning of this grasp that we find in the nature of things has completed itself, is brought to completion. Thereby, I have recognized the truth of the matter. What is important here, and what was already presaged by Husserl and Edith Stein, was the matter of relationality. Reality is not grasped as an object that simply stands still in front of oneself. Reality is a relationship to self that is not reducible to the capacity of the self for self-projection. Comparison is necessary in understanding the truth that emerges from the recognition of the, of the connection of the one seen to the reality seen. No grasp of reality is grasped in and of itself. So this epistemological and phenomenological detour is essential for Gardini. It is a far cry from most readings of Romans 1, 19 through 21. But the ph phenomenology of what is the life world presented to the eye is the condition for the possibility of what is meant by St. Paul when St. Paul says, ever since the creation of the world, 
His invisible attributes of eternal power and divinity have been able to be understood and perceived in what he has made. To stand in awe and to wonder at the beauty of what God has wrought cannot be accomplished without this purification of the eye's mechanistic view of reality. Reality is not just a machine. Sight is not just a photograph. We should be surprised, Gardini says, that we can discover an infinitude of minerals in a rock or in a crystal. This is a different perspective than the scientific one that goes immediately to the elephants, that goes immediately to the uh, fragmented elements that form the crystal. There is no reason, of course, why a chemistry professor and a Christian believer could not be found in the same person. But everything depends on the question of vision. Okay. That was my very long prologue. Uh, now to, to get to the question of technology and then the question of liturgy. How does technology lead to this dilemma? And I'm focusing here on the question of technology in the, the letters from Lake Como. So Gardini, as Danny mentioned, was born in Verona, but I think at the age of one, very young, his family moved to, to Germany, and he became famous in Munich as a, as a preacher and as a writer and was very involved in German culture. But his trip back to Italy, Lake Como, was kind of a homecoming, and it's He's filled with nostalgia, but he's also very aware of his tendency towards nostalgia and want, not wanting to make it something that's just nostalgic. But there's a very personal element to the letters. How does technology lead to this dilemma? What is the paradigm that technology introduces at the end of the modern world? In letter six, for example, he says that there's two ways of knowing. We can know by penetrating a thing, by examining the context, and we can know by living with it or unpacking, dissecting, and tearing apart that very thing. Later, philosophy begins to talk about the relationship between understanding and explanation. Gardini's point in uh, letter six is that you need both understanding and explanation. We can't get rid of mechanical descriptions of things. We can't get rid of the way that science fragments things and allows us to understand its elemental components. But you need some sense of understanding. You need some sense of examining context, living with it, and unpacking it and not just dissection. He also says that there's a developing tendency, and this is the seemingly more nostalgic part of what you find in the letters, there's a developing tendency of controlling living people. It's primitive, but constructed rashly and embodied in what he calls a monstrous system. It threatens human freedom. There's a system of machines that's engulfing life. Uh, it seeks free air. Life seeks free air in a secure basis. How can life retain its living character in this system? And then in letter eight, he begins to speak more directly about what he sees as the problem of technology itself, what he calls the dissolution of the organic. He says the people of Lake Cuomo have preserved an ancient culture, one that is tied to the land. They use tools and principles drawn from engineering to build their villas, like the Romans before them. But these were only supports for maintaining their organic relationship to the land. The two notes, nature and culture, can ring out harmoniously together. Uh, and this symbiosis between nature and culture is precisely what is lost in modernity. He recognizes, this gets into a, a separate letter where he talks about the masses. He recognizes that the serenity of the villas are only for the rich. The poor farmers who work the land will be ruined if they receive modern technology. Likewise, highways and motor roads and anything else associated with velocity are signs of, for him of an incipient decay. City folks who today spend a day in the garden to get away from the hustle and bustle of urban life know something is dynamic, but it is only fleeting. What should be done about this whole situation? He begins to ask this question over and over again in the letters to Lake Cuomo. Is there a way? He, he's very aware, for example, Gardini was an avid reader of all of German literature, but above all, he knew and could breathe the spirit of Goethe. Um, but he's very aware of his own internal tendency to kind of go back to a kind of Goethean, pantheistic understanding of where nature and culture go together. He's very, uh, on the one hand, there's the, the sense that in Italy, everything's better. In Germany, it's, it's pre-industrial. There's some vision here where the people are wedded to the land and they can get back to this organic relation. But he knows that nature and culture have been separated from one another and that never, there's no, not going to be any Goethean return 
to this idyllic existence of the best. So he's in a sense caught. Now, what I want to say about this vision is I could say a lot more about the letters, but I want to move on so we can get to the question of liturgy. What I want to say is that there's a deliberate incompleteness to what Gardini is proposing here, not only because he later refines his vision in the end of the modern world and in particularly in the late work on power, but there's something inherently incomplete about Gardini's whole project. Regarding the incomplete thought of Gardini, we can turn to a student of Gardini who currently occupies the office of Bishop of Rome. Pope Francis, speaking of the discernment, so Pope Francis went to uh, Germany um, after he'd been uh, provincial in Buenos Aires to write uh, a dissertation on the theology of culture of Romano Gardini. And if you want to know what was in that incomplete dissertation, read Evangelii Gaudium, uh, because it's almost word for word in Evangelii Gaudium. Uh, but the, I'm not making a point. Um, Robert Barron has a nice essay on Gardini and Francis. But Pope Francis, speaking of the sermon he learned while reading Romano Gardini, says, I learned this way of thinking from Romano Gardini. It was his style that captivated me. First of all, in his book, The Lord, Gardini showed me the importance of incomplete thought. He develops a thought to a certain point, but then invites you to stop, to gain space in order to contemplate. He creates room for you to encounter the truth. A fruitful thought should always be unfinished in order to allow space for subsequent development. With Gardini, this is Francis now, with Gardini I learned not to expect absolute certainties about everything, which is a symptom of an anxious spirit. Usually we think it's the other way around. His wisdom, Gardini's wisdom, has allowed me to confront complex problems that cannot be resolved simply by following norms, by using instead a kind of thinking that allows you to nav navigate conflicts without being trapped in them. End of quote. So the question then is, is what Pope Francis, or even the young Bergoglio, identified as an incomplete list, a incompleteness in Gardini, a failure or a saving grace? It's certainly a process of discernment, and what I want to suggest is his thoughts about technology are actually most saving if we see them not as fait accompli or as something to be completed, but in their this very com incompleteness that Francis identifies with Gardini. Gathering the fragments, and this is done with apologies to Sarah Coakley uh, in a remarkable article she wrote about Eucharistic fragments being gathered in a shared basket. Um, Gardini, I, I, I want to go through this quickly so we have some time for discussion, but Gardini obviously wrote a lot about liturgy, and he's most famous for his early work, The Spirit of the Liturgy. Let me say something about uh, Pope Benedict's love for early Gardini. The church, church is awakening within souls. This is Pope Benedict now. Gardini's expression had been wisely formulated since it finally recognized and experienced the church as something within us, not as an institution outside us, but something that lives within us. If until that time we had thought of the church primarily as a structure or organization, now at last we begin to realize that we ourselves were the church. The church is much more than an organization. It is the organism of the Holy Spirit, something that is alive, that takes hold of our inmost being. This consciousness found verbal expression with the concept of the mystical body of Christ, a phrase describing a new and liberating experience of the church. At the very, this is Ratzinger, Pope uh, Benedict now, uh, at the very end of his life, in the same year that the Constitution of the Church was published by the Council, Gardini wrote, the church is not an institution devised and built by men, but a living reality. It lives still throughout the course of time. Like all living reality, it develops, it changes, and yet, in the very depths of its being, it remains the same. Its inmost nucleus, nucleus is Christ. To the extent that we look upon the church as organization, like an association, like an association, we have not yet arrived at a proper understanding of it. Instead, it is a living reality, and our relationship with it ought to be life. Now, uh, to, in order to kind of extend this thought, coming directly from Pope Benedict, talking about the churches and awakening within souls in the early Gardini, not just in the spirit of the liturgy, but in other early texts, I want to draw attention now to uh, this text, which has come out in English translation in the last couple of weeks uh, through the good work of the McGrath Institute at Notre Dame, Liturgie uh, and Liturgische Gestaltung, 
um, is now available in English for the first time, Liturgische Bildung, in English for the first time. Um, it's a whole scale work from 1923 about, that was written just after the spirit of the liturgy. And uh, in the interest of time, I just want to highlight one main idea from Gardini's early work. So after writing the spirit of the liturgy, the work that made him most famous and really began to allow him to have a, a public reception, I mean, uh, uh, it, with youth groups in the church, um, he wrote this text, which he came back to and republished and re-edited many times um, uh, later in life about liturgical formation. But the point I want to make is that the, uh, the, the detour through his early phenomenology and the emphasis on getting to the reality of things through a dialogue with reality itself and getting over the mechanization process of reality to take hold in a technological age is directly thematized in his text on liturgical formation. Not only is there a section on uh, how we perceive the living reality of body-soul unity as a way to understand liturgical formation, but then there's a whole section dedicated to dingheit, like how is liturgical formation contingent upon thingness and have a relationship to thing? I mean, this early text by Hostrel now becomes to have a greater importance that Gardini, before he was interested in techniques for getting a better or more adequate liturgy, was interested in the way that we encounter things themselves in liturgical formation. Let me, this is a long quote, but this is from this, a central part, the section on thingness in his 19... 23 texts on liturgical formation. In the previous section, Soul and Body, we said that the deepest meaning to be found in the cultural movement of our day may be that we will be filled anew with humanity and strive for the true expression of human nature, not toward the spirit and not toward the animal, but toward what we truly are, human beings, soul that forms the body and body that is permeated by the soul and is expressed in revelation. We ought to become essential. For us, this means to be truly human. Our relations and actions in life, as well as our customs in society, our customs in labor, and our joy itself must become essentially human. There ought to be an anima, which is the forma corporis. There ought to be a soul, which is the form of the body. True spirit and also real body. How adequately the soul forms the body will be the measure of expression and clothing. The same spirit also strives towards the true reality of things. Formulas and concepts in their rightful sense and validity have barred our view from reality as a whole. This is what Pope Francis says in Evangelii Gaudium about the priority of reality to the idea. Formulas and concepts in their rightful sense and validity have barred our view from reality as a whole. We do not think with lively imaginations, but by signs and in systems of extractive features signifying things like pieces of cash which take on value, although they are valueless in themselves. We have not felt the shock of reality with an open heart or felt the uniqueness of things' reality. Now the will arises anew to see things instead of concepts, to think and speak of realities and not mere words, to deal with the whole world in its fullness and force and all its hardness and in fruitful confrontation is given to us as a task once again. Our task is to stand in awe before the intrinsic sense of things, to call them by name as they are, to hear their expression, and at the same time to target them with the will of formation. These are almost exactly the same words that he uses in the chapter on the letters of Lake Cuomo on the task that we stand before when we look at the role of technology in our lives. Our approach to things has to be with observing eyes and listening ears. Uh, we should not do violence to things, but we should completely involve ourselves in this way of expressing souls and bodies. In a very deep sense, the soul is called to be the forma of the world outside. This does not mean a pantheistic dissolution of the one into the other, rather that while man is alien to things, he's also mysteriously so close that he may use them for his expression. And others have looked upon this as the kind of the uh, starting point for an expressionism in Gardini himself. So, um, this was the sense in which Gardini saw liturgy uh, as, a, as a counterpoint to technology. And I want to be very clear that it's not 
some kind of mechanical antidote because that's the problem that Gardini signaled at the beginning is that we can once we see the way in which we're reformed and our vision to reality is reoriented through liturgy, then we are already running the risk of having an overly technocratic approach to liturgical reform. So there's a certain paradox there. But that's that's the point. Liturgy redeems the fragmentation that comes about through technology. But precisely, we have to be careful there that we're really looking at the dinghite, the thingness of reality that is encountered in the liturgical act and that is fostered through our programs of liturgical formation. And then we're not simply kind of devolving to um, a kind of utter opposition between technology and liturgy. Now, just a brief comment about the definition of technology, and then I can try to, to wrap things up. Uh, Gardini uh, famously uh, talked, not so much in the letters, but in his End of the Modern World from 1950, about a new technocratic paradigm. And as I've already said, uh, the essential definition of technocracy in Gardini is that power is being used through this filter of trying to change and master the world, what others have called the kind of Promethean enterprise, going back to the one who steals the fire from the gods and therefore wants to remake all of nature in the fashion of a, of a Prometheus, which of course was Karl Marx's uh, motto. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit, and this is going to be very quick, about how Gardini's questioning, and he, he poses technology more as a question than as an answer already in 1923, 1925, when he writes the letters. And I'll talk more about that in the, the seminar tomorrow. But how Gardini's questioning of technology fits in with both by purposes of comparison and by purpose of contrast with the other discussions about the question of technology in the early 20th century, starting with Martin Heidegger. Um, there's also a question, which I don't have time to go into, about the political context uh, of Gardini's own early writings. Uh, Paul, Silas, um, Paul Silas Werner has written uh, an essay on the 1924 work of Gardini called uh, Die Rettung des Politischen, The Saving of Politics, which gets into, maybe we can leave this more for the Q&A, Gardini's relationship to dependence upon and also difference from the conservative Catholic uh, political theologian Carl Schmitt. Um, and there's some interesting questions that, that, uh, that are raised there about Gardini's politics. So with that in mind, I have an image here of the uh, Amish raising a barn because in Heidegger's uh, mid-20th century essay, Die Frage nach der Technik, the essay concerning technology, he presents technology itself as a question that has to be answered. And he's doing this as a university professor who is trying to deal with the relationship between the life sciences and the human sciences. Um, and there's a lot of things going on at that period of Heidegger's life. But the, the definition he gives is he uses the German word das Gestell, uh, which in most of the translations is uh, rendered as the inframing, but it's not like the frame around a picture, it's more like, and this is why I like the Amish with their communitarian barn raising as the image to place before you, it's more like the frame that you have inside a house before you begin building the house. So for Heidegger, and he doesn't consider this the last word, but he considers this the beginning of a new form of reflection about truth and being itself. For Heidegger to think about technology is to think of it as something that allows us to think freely only if we look at why it has to be questioned in its very essence. And the definition that it comes up with regarding the essence of technology is that of uh, this kind of building, like the, the engineering, men my father was an engineer, so there's no offense it should be taken here by the engineers. Or the engineering mentality that everything has to be set up as an architect or engineer would in getting the essential framework in order before you can start building on something, that nothing can be just observed. Everything has to be put in a place like the Amish are doing in their communitarian fashion here. Uh, but of course, in, in Heidegger, it takes on much more ominous overtones. That definition is then taken up by Michel Foucault and by a follower of Michel Foucault called Giorgio Agamben. When Foucault uh, begins to think more about the relationship between Heidegger's questionable politics and the question about biopolitics, the politics of the body, and he, in a late work, uh, comes up with the French word le dispositif to define technology and the technology of politics itself, which is usually translated as the device. 
Um, uh, what I tried, this is Foucault now, what I tried to indicate with this name is in the first place a resolutely heterogeneous group that includes speeches, institutions, architectural installations, regulatory decisions, laws, administrative measures, scientific statements, philosophical, moral, philanthropic propositions, said as well as what is not said. These are the elements of the device. The device itself, the dispositif, the device itself is a network that is established between these elements. So Foucault is already beginning to see technology, not just as something that's done with nature, but as something that's inherently political and sociological, and that is going to regulate the body in this sense. If you know his work on prisons, he's kind of extending that here. And then in an essay he wrote in Italian called Il Apparato, which is a translation of the French Le Dispositif, uh, Agamben uh, says this about the device. I will literally call a device anything that has in some way the ability to capture, guide, determine, intercept, model, control, and ensure the gestures, behaviors, opinions, and discourses of living beings. Not only, therefore, the prisons, asylums, the panopticon, the schools, the confession, the factories, the disciplines, the legal measures, etc., whose connection with the power is in a certain sense evident, but also the pen, writing, literature, philosophy, agriculture, smoking, navigation, computers, cell phones, and why not the language itself, which is perhaps the oldest devices in which thousands and thousands of years are primate, probably without realizing the consequences that would follow had the unconsciousness of being captured. So el apparato for Agamben is all of this reality of technology, but understood in terms of a power that envelops uh, contemporary life. So for Agamben, this refers not to a political theology, but to a state of exception in which people are placed outside. And then he goes on to talk about surveillance mechanisms. The electronic capture of fingerprints and retina, subcutaneous tattoo, like other practices are the same, is el are elements that help define that threshold. The security reasons that are invoked to justify them should not impress us. That is not the issue. History teaches us that the practices reserved at the beginning of foreigners apply to all citizens. So Agamben, without going uh, too far into this, is already beginning to think about how there's a political meaning that even Foucault didn't see in the definition of technology now as il apparato or the device. And he particularly wants to focus on, he was very worried about what happened in the United States after 9-11 and wouldn't come to the United States after the development of a Homeland Security Office because of he felt that technology was being used to surveil everything. The person who I think who captures best all of this is Walker Percy, the student of Gardini, the kind of American who has the existentialist version of Gardini's religious epistemology and that would be a topic for another, another lecture altogether. But having now said a word about how the, the, this early 20th, 20th century thought about technology has been extended into other realms and even into political realms, of which uh, Gardini was no stranger. He had definitely had a political agenda in mind when he wrote the letters to Le Cuomo in 1923 and 1925. But let me try to conclude now by talking about how Gardini's real contribution stands in the area of planting in a virtual age signposts that lead to reality. Gardini offers an incomplete thought that can be compared and contrasted to the complete thoughts of postmodern thinkers regarding das Gestell, le dispositif, and il apparato. These other thinkers, Foucault, Agamben, rightly bring to the fore the question of power about which Gardini wrote a book in 1960, Die Macht. Here he focused on the possibility of re-engaging human action, Die Möglichkeit des Tuns, in the light of his devastating critique of, of technology in the book he wrote just one year earlier, The End of the Modern World. In this book on power, there are very interesting comparisons to Hannah Arendt's account of power as employed in the modern technological polis, both of which go back to this Heideggerian critique which I mentioned a minute ago. But back to Gardini. Gardini still emphasizes two dimensions that are lacking in the secular postmodern account of the essence of technological power. First, there's a certain fatalism that pervades the postmodern account. By contrast, in Gardini, the exercise of human freedom, self-determined freedom, 
by the expressive human agent always stands at the center. A human person cannot extract herself out of the matrix of the technological paradigm. Even a cloistered nun at the end of the modern age is co-determined by the technocratic paradigm. But liturgical rhythms are just one form of ascesis that can help free agents to face the essence of technology in its all-embracing all embracing dimensions and develop new forms of life that are not technocratic. Christian freedom is the answer to what Gardini calls in the end of the modern world, the unpagan paganism. His account of that freedom sometimes relies on a heavily neoplatonic understanding of intellectual vision as a way to grasp the totality of the life world. But he's still grappling to find the right language to express, to express this dynamic. The paths opened up by Husserl, Simmel, and Edith Stein can be revisited with this issue in mind. Second, the postmodern path started by Heidegger rejected humanism. See Heidegger's letter on humanism. Rejected humanism as an authentic past because human, humanism, in Heidegger's view, still adhered to the ontotheological definition of the nature of the human person. Humanism was still involved in the task of defining a fixed human nature. For Gardini, human nature is a question that has to be looked at in conjunction with the questions of technology and liturgy, but in its total incompleteness. Human nature itself had to be deconstructed, according to Heidegger. Heidegger and Max Scheler diverged on this point, and Gardini, who spoke to Scheler, might be closer to Scheler than to Heidegger. Gardini sees the dignity of the human person rooted in the absolute. And this is where the book that Danny mentioned, The Lord, was actually pivotal. Christian revelation taught that an image of God was made visible in the human person, was expressed in the human person, particularly that Bonaventurian notion of expression, and that each person was endowed with absolute dignity. As a result, the eraser of humanism is unthinkable in the light of Christian revelation. Gardini sought to preserve a new path to Christian humanism that was enlightened by neither modernity nor postmodernity. The light that Gardini shed on this new, still undiscovered humanism came from the encounter with the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Gardini. I'd like to thank Professor Casarella for his engaging presentation, and now I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, I'll let Professor Casarella uh, manage the Q&A, and uh, we'll take the first one here in the room, and then we'll see if we have uh, a question on uh, from the our online audience. Uh, well, first of all, on uh, Berg Rottenfels was a gathering place precisely in the period when he's writing these the letters and uh, liturgical formation texts, and that shows his connection both to youth groups and basically the the forerunners of Lumen Christi were present in Burg Um It's not an accident at all that we can have this discussion here, this discussion that usually doesn't place in doesn't take place in academic spaces. And Gardini also had to go outside of academic spaces. And the mention of Rahner is also interesting because um, he inhabits the Lehrstuhl, the, the professorship that Gardini had in the this uh, professorship for Christian Weltanschau and Christian worldview. He inherits that from Gardini. And um, his text, The Foundations of Christian Faith, which is my least favorite text of Rahner, was actually written when Rahner assumed that, that chair um, and kind of shows Rahner going off in a slightly different direction. But to your question, it's, a, it's an important question, but I think that, and that's where I began the lecture, is by talking about how there's different kind of uh, understandings and debates about the Gardenian liturgical reform. In the 20s, um, you see Gardini, uh, he writes already in 1918, uh, the abbot at Maria Lach uh, publishes Der Geist der Liturgy, The Spirit of the Liturgy, which is his kind of total vision. And um, you probably know, uh, young Ratzinger was so taken by the text that he wrote a text with the same title, The Spirit of the Liturgy, to not imitate Gardini, but to pay homage to Gardini. So. I don't want to get involved in the discussion of uh, Gardini's many kind of twists and turns with regard to uh, the liturgical reform movement. 
Um, it's clear that when he started Maria Lach, and uh, and also the, the 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 more Platonic vision of Odo Caso on the mysteries of Christian faith in the liturgy were very much in the background. And I think Gardini's work on uh, Revelation history, uh, just as you found also later in from Balthasar, were a bit of a taking of a distance from the overly Neoplatonic or theurgic vision of some of the monks in in Maria Lach and in Odo Caso. Uh, that would be that's actually a talk that I'm going to give in a couple of weeks at Notre Dame on at a liturgical conference on Gardini and, and the spirit of the liturgy. But that would be a way in which Gardini was taking his distance. But does he go as far as Rahner does in the foundations of Christian faith and developing a new kind of transcendental Christology? I don't think so. I think uh, Gardini is more Thomistic. And what I was trying to show is that there's this kind of convergence of Thomism and phenomenology in the early Gardini that's still trying to hold on to what is basically a more traditional Augustinian worldview that he thinks is necessary to carry liturgy in and beyond the council. But you're going to find people both more progressive than Gardini and Rahner and people more conservative than Gardini and Rahner claiming Gardini as their own. And that's in some ways legitimate given how much history he lived through and how the level of thought that he was trying to develop was not in terms of the latest development of the reform or reform of the reform, but in terms of underlying principles. In fact, I was once actually, I had the, this is a little bit off topic, but it might be helpful to you. Uh, I was actually in a seminar with Cardinal Ratzinger before he became Pope and some theologians where we were discussing Ratzinger's book, The Spirit of the Liturgy. Uh, and one of Ratzinger's students, a very eminent person who later was, became Archbishop and Cardinal, said, what did you mean about ad orientum? What is your position ad orientum in the book? And Ratzinger gave the answer that I think was so Gardini-like. He was like, it's theological. It's not about whether ad orientum or versus populum. Ratzinger, in, in a presence of friends, refused to allow like himself to be pinned down in terms of ad orientum versus versus populum. It's Christocentric. It's theological. And that's a Ratzinger, I think, pointing to what I'm trying to point to in Gardini, in that we need the philosophical and theological principles ultimately to guide us uh, into liturgical formation and to face the technocratic paradigm that uh, surrounds us. So I don't know if that was adequate. So Gardini was an expert on poetry. He wrote a book on Rilke. And of course, what von Balthasar emphasized in that book with which I started is his uh, vision of the vision of Christ in Dostoevsky's novels as the kind of starting point for Gardini's whole theological projects. So there would be a lot of interesting points of comparison on the uh, uh, the question about Dichtung and poetic speech in Gardini and Heidegger, but I haven't explored that specifically. On the question of nostalgia, um, there's one famous essay on Heidegger called Die Sprache aus Meskir about Heidegger's rural roots and his, especially, I mean, already uh, when the Chilean wrote about Heidegger, Farias about Heidegger and politics, very early on, uh, looked to Heidegger's weird fascination with Angelus Silesius in German mysticism, which is very much out of that rural German context. And Heidegger had a brother who was a priest um, and was very, uh, as you probably know, taken by Catholic liturgical forms. And you could really see the kind of um, question about the fourfold in Heidegger as a kind of sec secular uh, distortion of Catholic liturgy. Um, there's also the question about Heidegger's Lutheranism uh, and, and connection to Bultmann that needs to be looked at. But anyway, I could, th that's a very interesting set of issues. Uh, but I would actually bring that together by saying they both fail politically, Heidegger and Gardini, um, because of their nostalgia. Heidegger for obvious reasons that you see in the Black Notebook. But Gardini, uh, and I didn't have time to go into this, um, at the time that he was bringing together people at Borg Rotenfels, in other words, uh, has an un... And this is like in the 20s. I mean, he, he begins to come to a greater self-awareness about this problem already in the, the 30s and later on, I think when uh, Schwara's writing against anti-Semitism and Stimmen der Zeit. But in the 20s, I mean, his whole message to the youth 
was about uh, Gehorsamkeit and obedience. And, and it's all, almost an echo of Heidegger there in trying to you know, listen to the peals of being in the rural countryside. But the, uh, I mean, Peterson has written extensively about this, the appeal to a principle of order, which comes directly out of his relationship to and differentiation from Carl Schmitt and Gardini in the early 20s is problematic. And, and is a problematic form of nostalgia that needs to be. That's why I think the purification through some version of what a government is doing is probably very necessary to recover Gardini today. But thank you for that question. So the first question is, can liturgy itself become a technology? Uh, and the second question was whether in the face of this set of problems, uh, Gardini's notion of seeing can help us overcome that impasse. Um, and the answers are yes and yes. Um, so on the first point, I mean, that, that's what I consider the incompleteness or the paradoxicality of Gardini's project, which may be very unsatisfying to many people, but I think Pope Francis hit the nail on the head when he points to this as a, as a saving grace in Gardini that, um, you really can't resolve all the tensions. The point is to enter into the tensions. So liturgical reform was embraced by Gardini, and liturgical reform was advanced by Gardini. And the letter that I said at the beginning of the lecture, Gardini writing right after the promulgation of the, the Constitutional Liturgy at the Second Vatican Council, says maybe not erneuerung, maybe not renewal. It seems to be Gardini pulling back. And then you could say, Oh, he's in favor of reform and reform. But I didn't want to say that either because I don't think that's Gardini's vision. Gardini is trying to get to the underlying question about the liturgy. So I think whether it's reform or reform of the reform, there's always the danger in a liturgical existence that we get overly technological. And so there was definitely in my talk a fundamental uh, tension between technology and liturgy. But if you see liturgy as the antidote, then you're technologizing liturgy. Then you're turning it into something that's instrumental. Liturgy is always praise for itself. Liturgy is root, this is in Nicholas of Cusa, by the way. Liturgy is rooted in the understanding of ontology. That, I mean, Cusa takes from Dionysius the notion that when we look at being, we see all things directed beyond being to an absolute. And that's what he calls skins, Nicholas Okuza calls skins uh, laudis, uh, the knowledge we have of praise in being itself without revelation. To the second question about seeing, seeing can be, I mean, maybe the way to put it is skiing, what, the way that we see the ding height of reality, the thingness of reality uh, in and through liturgical formation is not so much something that can be put into a manual, but is through um, an overall process of uh, metanoia and conversion that can't be uh, abstracted from the mechanical, mechanical models that we need in liturgical formation. That there has to be an underlying, if you want to use this word, spirituality, liturgical spirituality that informs and that is expressed in and that follows from liturgical renewal. So I think that's what is meant by the reform of vision itself, that there's not some quick fix, but that there's this underlying, and maybe that's why, going back to where I started, Maria Locke, that the, the, the abbot of Maria Locke writes and helps publish, help writes the preface to and helps publish uh, his very, very early work that made him famous, The Spirit of the Liturgy. Uh, it's not that you have to be in a monastery to experience the liturgy, but something of the spirit of the monastery has to be imbuing the whole of the liturgical renewal. I think Gardini's think when he's writing the letters, he's thinking about a, a fission and fusion, atomic fission and fusion. I mean, I think he's aware. I mean, this this is so ironic to say this here next to you know Stagfield, where Fermi worked what two decades later. Um, I think and Gardini sees Fermi coming, sees uh, the Manhattan Project on the horizon. I, I I think he's really. I mean, this becomes a big thing in like the. 70s and 80s, you know, about a nuclear apocalypse as a condition for the possibility of thinking in our existence on the earth. But I think Gardini is really thinking 
in that way. So he he rails about you know against you know street cars and people not being in their buggies as if the next step were the atomic bomb, and you could see that as exaggerated. But I think his point is not about more or less or faster or slower. His point is about um, what is the relationship between nature and culture. What is the fundamental underlying ontology or relationship to Wirklichkeit, to reality. Um, and in that sense, uh, Gardenia is helping us to get some kind of orientation to reality. Um, so I think that the scientific questions that you raised earlier today and now are very much uh, important and are very much informing my work. I mean, this is not directly on Gardenia, but I'll mention it anyway. Um, a book that was written by someone who actually studied here at the Lutheran School, Alejandro Garcia Rivera, The Garden of God, uh, which is a kind of ecological uh, theology dedicated to Pierre Théard de Chardin. Um, but it starts with this uh, true story. Alex Garcia Rivera um, had been a Lutheran pastor, um, or had before he became a Lutheran pastor, was sent uh, to work as a physicist at the Boeing plant in Seattle. And one day they took him out into the back of the Boeing plant, and they introduced him to a new project they wanted him to work on, which was air launch cruise missiles. And if you read the preface to this book, The Garden of God, um, it's about how he, Alex Garcia Rivera, very much in the spirit of a Gardini in the end of the modern world, saw the world blowing up before him. Then he came to Chicago to study theology, and he became not just the Lutheran, but ultimately a Catholic theologian teaching at the Jesuit school. But that, that parable in the Garden of God, I think, captures, it's not that uh, everything has to be doomsday. I mean, for both uh, Garcia Rivera and for Gardini, it's about finding human freedom in the midst of the cosmos. But you need this total vision. You need this Ubersicht. And it's not easy to do that without falling into a technological paradigm at the same time. Anyway, thank you very much.